have now come to the last panel of today. Uh, there's still more on the program, but this is our last panel. Uh, and this one is about sovereignty and the nation state from a European perspective. And to lead uh, the panel is Robert Tyler of New Direction. Well, um, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, you know, sovereignty in the European nation state is a, is a hot topic at the moment. Uh, if, if you have ever spent any time in Brussels, where, where I live and work at the moment, you'll find that no issue divides the European policymakers and the European public more than the notion of whether they want to move towards a more centralized and federated Europe or whether they want to keep power down with the people. Uh, uh, and it's, it's one of those interesting points because a lot, of the, a lot of the times when you tell people you work for a conservative think tank, they often ask, what is it that a conservative actually conserves? Well, I think the answer that we seem to be getting from today's conference and indeed from, from the works of Roger Scruton is that we are conserving the nation state and we are conserving a common sense of values, of traditions, of history, of language and so on. Uh, and this is something that is increasingly under threat, both from within our nations and from without. Uh, and I think to help me and help us sort of break down what it means to, um, what, it, what, what the future of the nation state is in Europe, we have a very excellent panel. Uh, we have uh, Kasper Storving again, the uh, Danish literary scholar and the author of numerous books on Nordic political culture. Uh, we're joined by Jorge Gonzalez, uh, the host of an excellent podcast, uh, Un Uncommon Decency, uh, which if you're not subscribed to, I highly recommend. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, and he's a researcher at the Center-Right Civismo Foundation in Madrid. Uh, we're joined also by Christian uh, Anton uh, Smedhaug, I think I've said that right, uh, who is an author and an agricultural expert who wrote the critically acclaimed uh, Feeding the World in the 21st Century. And then we are joined once again by uh, Hannes Kaseresen, who is a professor of politics from the University of Iceland and a very close friend of New Direction, who is currently writing a book on Nordic conservatism. So let me hand over to Christian first. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and uh, I got a little inspired during the day, so I added a few uh, slides to my uh, my short speak, which I which we, and I might have added on the top of this: the nation states and sovereignty, the best of the West, because I believe that the nation state and the sovereignty attached to that that's actually made us what we are. That's made the West the leading part of, uh, of the world, uh, at least until now. So, um, I also had a few citations which I think are very relevant, both from uh, Nicolas Davila and also from Alfred Marshall. And these are the main issues, in, in my head at least. It's about the values and the civilization, as in how we organize it, how we use the state, what kind of state do we have, how do you regulate between state and market. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's as, a, as a comment, it's worth to draw a little attention to the, to the German slogan after the Second World War. Uh, so viel market wie möglich, so viel staat wie nötig. So viel market, so, so uh, so market, um, so market as possible and so viel state as necessary. Um, that is what is possible and what is necessary is, of course, the big definitions, but these are the things we are discussing and how we arrange our world. And it's a kind of cultural uh, heterogenic area that we are approaching with the Protestant Northwest, with the Catholic continent, with the Orthodox uh, East, uh, and, of course, many borderlines, and then some parts of, of, of Muslims after the Osman Empire uh, fall out. And, uh, and this uh, Europe has historically been a heterogeneous region of different nations within states with changing borders, longing for having nation states. But the fight for this has been hard. It's been kind of going through all the uh, European history. It's still not solved in the Eastern Europe, as I think the Ukraine crisis is an example of. 
Well, the Western borders have been relatively stable since mid-19th century. Uh, a process that was really strengthened, not at least politically, with the peace of Westphalia in 1648. But, <clears throat> as has been discussed here earlier on, a little bit Snorre and, uh, and uh, taking the Nordic history, Scandinavian history a little further on, we know that Norway, Sweden and Denmark has been more or less continuous kingdoms within reasonable, uh, what to say, nation states in more or less uh, thousand years. So it's a kind of special case in the upper northwest. And uh, as I like to point out, Norway as a kingdom is 1150 years this year. In first uh, gathered in 1872, and there will also be a program for this in Oslo, the 7th of June. So uh, there will be um, possible to read more uh, about that on, uh, on a sheet behind there, just to mention it. But, but it also is an important point, which is related to the Danish history, is, is going to Denmark. It's not that easy, because Denmark has been Denmark for 1,100 years, and Norway is Norway for 1,100 years, and Sweden for 1,900. It's a little more unclear <laughs> when it was really started. And, and Iceland has been a free state since uh, 930. So it, it's important to know and it's important to understand, but it says something about the heterogeneous situation of, of Europe. And in my view, these long-time processes has actually made Europe a political laboratory with different countries developing different economic strategies. And that has been an part, important uh, part of our success. And then we, in just a short version then, we can think of Europe as a successive economic history which started with Port Portugal, then we come with Spain, the Netherlands, and then, uh, and then England, UK uh, became the leaders going through kind of economic development. Still, the Anglo-Saxon might say have the upper hand if you consider the global Anglo-Saxon uh, world. But anyhow, I think that to understand this, to know that the heterogeneous, after a while, nation states actually managed to make the most powerful and strong and economically successful part of the world. It has to be realized that it has to do with the values, it has to be to the arrangement, it has to be to how we arrange the states and the nation states that got these functional units going. And that fought down the, the Soviet Union in the short 20th century. It also went far beyond China, who has been a relatively important economic power in uh, the 15th and 16th century, but it fell down. And still China is trying to come up, but it, but it just managed, I think, to find the right balance between freedom, uh, market, and government, which means that it might go down again. But the in interesting thing is that after we uh, finally managed to fight down the Soviet empire with the free Western Europe, the first thing we did afterwards was to impose the European Union. So we lost the Union in the East, and we made a new Union in the West. And it's very hard to see that that has been a very successful economic strategy. And that's why we're coming down to nation states and the sovereignty. How do we handle this idea of having these European unions, even if it's the East or in the West, or you might say in the Southern Slaves, Yugoslavia, it was also uh, also ended relatively badly. Why do we all have this idea of unions in Europe instead of having a reasonable cooperation through sovereign nation states, cooperate where it's rational, and in, uh, <coughs> having a reasonable amount of power left in, in the states? And I think this is uh, a kind of uh, the really pressing question now. We hope that this was the end of history. The Berlin Wall fell, and we should rearrange Europe, and then we will be on top of it. And now we are standing in 2020, and no one actually need. Why did, how did we end here after having this, um, uh, this uh, big victory in, in the 1989-19? in the uh, 91 period. And we have a lot of crises. Uh, Ms. Merkel means that we shuffled us. Uh, I think that was a little, um, it's, a, it's a hard sell. You, you know, we have different 
crisis coming up for the last uh, 15 years. And what is interesting, and especially interesting standing right uh, in front of Margaret Thatcher, is that it was the Anglo-Saxon who made the first move into a kind of free market thinking in, in the early uh, 1980s. But on the other hand, it was the Anglo-Saxons who made the first move away from the free market thinking in the mid-2010s with first with uh, then Brexit and then Donald Trump who were trying to reorganize, reorganize the globalization. So the continent is left behind on both times in a way and the Anglo-Saxons is more or less ruling the world going back to more or less states. But the point is, is are they going back to nation states or to states? Because in the eastern part they are building nation states, in the western parts I'm not sure on what we are doing actually. Uh, and I'm not sure that anyone really knows what they're doing in the Western part relating to the state, nation, states dichotomy. And I think that is one of the important things. And that leads me to the, to the last point, actually. It is, we didn't see the end of history in 1989 and with the adaption we then tried to impose. So what is the future of history? Who will have the alternative story? Who will have the alternative story that has to, do, to be developed through the 2020s as to be the rearrangement of the new global order and have to be the arrangement of how to understand the state and the nation and the, the continuous dispute between state and markets. And I think that is for my, uh, what's my presentation, some reflections on the European history on that um, basis. Thank you. We uh, invite Jorge Gonzalez to give his presentation now. Um, well, let me just say how uh, delighted I am to be here, and thank you so much, Robert, for uh, moderating this panel. Um, I think one of the one of the pitfalls that you that we can run into when uh, at, a, at, a, at a conference like this is is to fall back on the same tried and tested mantras that have worked for conservatives in, in the past. Right? When it comes to sovereignty, we all know it. It's good. We want more of it. Uh, the nation state is a great innovation, and we want to preserve it. But I'd like to maybe try to take a step uh, right back and explore some of the underlying uh, assumptions behind the idea of sovereignty. And, and so allow me, indulge me as I as I take a detour into political theory. Um, as a way, and, and I'll sort of build, build it up, uh, build it up until um, until I uh, finish off by addressing uh, the current uh, state of sovereignty in the EU. But so sovereignty really is one of the uh, thorniest uh, concepts in political theory. I find um, it's it's a it's a sort of shiny object. It's very hard to define. Sovereignty has two elements. When you when you're trying to define sovereignty, you've got on one hand power, right, raw power that you can exercise over a, a group of people, but the other half of sovereignty is some sort of legal validation. There's some sort of, you know, it's, it's closer to authority. So that, the, the combination of those two things gives us sovereignty, and sovereignty is a, um, um, you know, this is the, the irony of a panel like this is that uh, sovereignty is a European concept by definition, and we're, we're addressing, uh, you know, the the fate and the state of sovereignty in, 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 in present-day Europe, but really this is, this is a European project. It's born um, in um, the, the, the 16th century. Uh, actually, a, a lot of people wrongly assume that sovereignty is born in the 17th century with Thomas Hobbes' uh, Leviathan. Uh, the reality, though, is that one century before uh, Hobbes, uh, uh, Jean Baudin, who was a French uh, philosopher, political theorist, had come up with, you know, the, the uh, 
uh, largely the same kind of theory for, for why there should be a sovereign power, right? Um, and what is, so, what is so interesting to me in, in, in the concept of sovereignty is that Hobbes and Boudin, one century apart, are thinking and writing in much the same historical circumstances, namely uh, religious conflict, religious wars, right? If you think about Boudin in the second half of the, 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 the 16th century, uh, um, Second half of the 16th century was a terrible time for France. There was a, a, a lot of uh, inter, interfaith uh, 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 conflict between the Huguenots and, and the Catholics. Uh, actually, Baudin wrote uh, his uh, six, six, six Livres sur la République, six books on the Commonwealth. He wrote it uh, four years after the St. Bartholomew's uh, Day Massacre, where um, the Catholic League uh, uh, murdered, slaughtered, really, uh, uh, Huguenots by, by, the, by the hundreds in, in the, near the Louvre uh, Place. Um, and Hobbes, one century later, is, uh, is met with much the same uh, sort of context. And so they both, uh, at, at different times, they both come up with uh, the necessity for there to be a strong, central, undivided source of power to uh, mediate between the factions, right? If you have a country where, uh, with, with a lot of uh, religious strife and the, the, the king is a Catholic, then the Huguenots are going to be uh, at the, the, the king's throat, or vice versa, right? So the idea of sovereignty is there should be a supreme, undivided source of authority reigning supreme in the country, and, and there should be no higher locus of authority above uh, the sovereign uh, king. Um, and let, let's uh, fast forward to 1648, which is obviously a very ominous date uh, when it comes to the, the, the history of sovereignty. The, the Treaty of Westphalia gets signed that year in Osnabrück, in today's uh, Lower Saxony. Uh, this was really a momentous uh, moment. I mean, if you read a, a, a historian like Joachim Wheel of Cambridge, uh, he says that the Treaty of Westphalia is the closest that humanity has ever gotten to universal peace, <laughs> and that it, it all sort, sort of trends uh, downward from, from there. But be that as it may, maybe that's hyperbole, but be that as it may, um, uh, the tr Treaty of Westphalia really was a momentous uh, point because it, it offered the other side of the coin, right? So Boudin and Hobbes had theorized the necessity for there to be a strong state, but for that sovereignty to really be effective, uh, other sovereign powers had to... Uh, to allow for that sovereignty to be exercised. They had to, to uh, commit to not interfere into one another's affairs. So that's uh, what Westphalian sovereignty is, the, the, the inviolability of borders, the fact that you're sovereign in your territory and I'm sovereign over here in mine. So, um, uh, and, then, and then fast forward to the 19th century, which is obviously the century of national sovereignty. It's really when... Um, the, uh, the concept of the nation state gets invented, right? So before the 19th century, there was the idea of the state, right? Well, then Hobbes had theorized the, the necessity for there to be a strong state, but that, that, uh, that, that entity wasn't necessarily always fitted to the nation. And in the 19th century, in the, the, what uh, French historian Anne-Marie Thiès has called the spring of nations, you have this idea that there should be an, a state for every nation, that those two things go together and that nations should be uh, allowed to self-govern. Um, so, um, um, uh, in the 19th century, I wanted to mention as well, one of my favorite um, uh, texts of, of political theory was, uh, is Ernest Renan, who was a, a French philosopher who gave a very famous speech at the Sorbonne in 1882 where he defined the nation. You know, what is a nation? He said, a nation is both a common past and a present commitment to perpetuate that past. So that there, there's, two, there's two elements to there, there being a nation, and both are equally important. He said the nation was a, a referendum of every day. It was a, a, the, uh, the plebiscite of, of every day. Um, then I want to be, I want to very quickly, and, and please, Rob, I, I would appreciate any and all manner of, of body language and hand gestures. Um, I want to jump uh, to the 20th century, which is obviously, you know, if you, if you listen to someone, someone like Yoram Hazani, who's one of the finest intellectuals that our movement has at the moment. He says that, obviously, with the two world wars in, in the 20th century, um, uh, that, is, that has been interpreted as the excesses of nationalism. And so what comes after the two world wars is the era of supranationalism, primarily in Europe, with the delegation of powers to the European Union. Joram Hazany actually has a really interesting kind of thought process around this. He says that that is a mistake. Uh, World War II wasn't about the excesses of nationalism. Hitler was not a nationalist. Hitler was a racialist, uh, was a racial imperialist that has got nothing to do with nationalism. And in fact, he says nationalism was the opposite. Nationalism was the idea that 
here's my country, I get to rule over uh, the, these, uh, the, the, this, the, these borders, and your country is none of my business, um, which is the opposite of what the Third Reich did. Um, but be that as it may, um, you know, uh, at the end of World War II marks the launch of European integration. This is, this is really one of the, uh, in, my, in my view, one of the more one of the more consequential events of the past century has been really the, uh, the supranationalism that, is, that, is, uh, that has been launched after World War II. And, um, and here's, here's one where we get into a really, really uh, interesting kind of, really the crux of this debate. And Rob, you've, you're going to tell us about this because you've been, uh, you've been paying attention to the conference on the future of Europe, which uh, from what I get from what you've uh, <laughs> laid out is, has been really quite, quite a circus. But... Um, uh, in, in the, I think the, the question we have to ask ourselves is, you know, does European integration necessarily erode national sovereignty? Is the fact that European nation states are working with one another on, on issues of common interest, does that necessarily reduce the sovereignty of each one individually? That is, that is I think, the, 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 the crux of the question. Um, um, you know, I... I, I would, I would, I, I would contend that it doesn't. I, w I, w I would think that um, you know when um, uh, European states get to, for instance, uh, agree to have a, a common, a common market uh, with no uh, barriers to trade, and they cre set up a regulatory authority to govern that market. That's not necessarily an erosion of sovereignty because I'm, I'm deliberately conferring. This is what the European Union calls the principle of conferral. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, by consent conferring powers to a, a supranational authority. So I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that we, we are seeing the erosion of national sovereignty because we have the EU. I mean, we are seeing the erosion of national sovereignty, and that's, and that's what, we, um, what we need to address. But, um, um, you know, I think what, what you've seen, what you've seen with, with the EU is that, you know, ideally we would like to have a common market without a regulatory superstate. This is what the Brits have always wanted. This is this. I'll, I'll get to the British case in a second. But the reality is that in with the, the with today's European Union, you can't separate the two. You have the common market, and you have a superstructure on top of it that uh, dictates policy from from Brussels. Um, and a good example again is the 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 the, the case of the UK. Um, there's there's a remarkable uh, book that was published uh, last year by a historian at Cambridge called Robert Toombs. The books the book is This Sovereign Isle, a very good book where he explains why the UK joined the European Economic Community in 1973. It joined essentially because there were there, there was a a, a um, a, a, a kind of a, a school of thought within the Foreign Office and Westminster that said we we are uh, living uh, post the post imperial decline right where we've lost all of our colonial possessions and the only way for the United Kingdom to stay globally relevant is to join the single market so that's why they join but the they, the in the thinking of of the the um, the political consensus in Britain at the time, they didn't want any of the, the, the regulatory superstructure. They didn't want to be joining a federal project. They wanted to be in the common market. And Brexit is the moment when the British people realizes that they, they cannot have one without the other and we need to pull out. Um, but I'm going to fast forward because I, I know um, the time is short. Uh, but in, in a nutshell, I think the question today is posed in the following terms. The future of the EU will be decided between those who believe in intergovernmentalism, namely the voluntary cooperation between sovereign member states at the Council of the European Union, and those who believe in supranationalism, those who believe in setting up new institutions that are not democratic and not accountable that are going to be dictating policy for, for all of us. Um, and that, that's what I think the, um, the, um, the, the real dilemma is. Um, um, and and what, I, what, I, what I think is really, really important to highlight is that Europe is going to have to choose between supranationalism and democracy. It cannot have both. A supranational EU cannot be democratic because there's no European demos. There's 27 different demos in each of our countries, and we can be, the, the countries can be democratic, but if, if we we're having this, uh, this, uh, this uh, political system that federates all of these different countries, the decisions that that, that that system takes are not going to be democratic. And we're seeing that with, I mean, the, the, the EU calls this democratic deficit, which I think is a, is a nice euphemism for essentially absence of democracy. Um, but um, the, the EU tries to palliate this by, for instance, uh, an, uh, um, um, growing the powers of the European Parliament, right? And you know, this is um, this is a, a bit. Um, I mean, I, I perhaps shouldn't be uh, trashing the European Parliament at a conference partly funded by a, 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 
a, a European Parliament linked uh, foundation, but, um, but the reality is that look at, look at the elections to the European Parliament. The elections to the European Parliament, and you guys are going to be, uh, uh, we're going to see, be seeing one in, uh, in a couple, in a year and a half. Um, they're fought on national battlegrounds. There, there's no European news cycle. When, uh, you know, if I'm running for, for, for office in the European Parliament, I go to my constituents in my home country and I, and I tell them the message they want to get, which is a national message, and then I get elected to serve a European mandate. But it's not, you know, there, there's no European demos. Um, and what, I, what, I, what I'd love to finish off by, and I hope this is okay, Robert, I, I just want to quote um, a, a really, really interesting piece of writing by Roger. Um, this is in the introduction to a book that I think someone earlier in, in another pa panel mentioned, Where We Are. And this is really Sir Roger's book on sovereignty. This is, this is where his thoughts on sovereignty really came to the fore. Um, a year after the Brexit referendum, and thank God he got to witness the, not, not Brexit itself, but at least the, the vote on Brexit. Um, he said, you know, when Cameron, when David Cameron asked the British people to vote on whether to leave the EU, he did, he, um, he, he did his utmost to persuade, to persuade the electorate that the question was a purely economic one. Are we better off, in or out? But for many ordinary citizens, however, the question was about identity and sovereignty. For such people, matters were at stake that the politicians had systematically marginalized and which were more important to them than all the economic and geopolitical arguments. The question was not what will make us better off, but rather who we are, where we are, what holds us together in a shared political order, and on, and on whom we have conferred the right to govern us. It is not only the British who are faced with these questions. They are the political questions of our time, and all across Europe, people are beginning to ask them. Moreover, they're not questions that can be settled by economic arguments, since they need to be answered before any such arguments make sense. And I think this is exactly what we're doing here at a, at a conference like this one. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you very much, Jorge. And uh, it, it's always interesting when people talk about the democratic, democratic deficit because I'm always reminded of the line by the former uh, Greek finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis, who uh, famously said, uh, when they talk about a democratic deficit in the European Union, they might as well talk about a deficit of oxygen on the moon. There is no <laughs> democracy. So, <laughs> uh, perhaps, Casper, if you would give a few short remarks now. <coughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so um, I will uh, talk a bit about why nation states created peace and stability in post-war Europe. And in fact, uh, this is a, a subject that I've written a book about uh, because in 2012, the European Union received the Nobel Peace Prize uh, actually here in, in Oslo. Uh, with, the argument was, of course, that it was the European Union who has uh, created uh, peace and stability. And, and I don't think that's uh, the correct story, at least it's not the, the whole story. Uh, on the contrary, it's the establishment of culturally homogeneous uh, nation states. And uh, So I will foc focus on, 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 uh, on the history leading up to establishing uh, these uh, kind of uh, uh, nation states, and I will, of course, draw heavily on Roger Scruton's uh, arguments, but also arguments from American historians such as uh, Jerry Mahler and uh, Samuel Huntington. Uh, more specifically, I will make the case for the culturally homogeneous uh, nation-state, that is, uh, a nation whose majority uh, shares the same culture. The reason is that this kind of state creates peace and stability within because it draws on social cohesion, and it also creates stability on a larger scale among nations because it solves border conflicts. So peace within and peace without. Uh, most liberals, though, are at unease with nationalism, of course, both intellectually and morally. They go to great lengths to demonstrate that nationalism is deliberately constructed and therefore ought to be deconstructed. And uh, liberal moralists scorn value systems uh, based on narrow group identities rather than universalism. Recently, though, Francis Fukuyama has admitted that the existence of a national identity is needed for 
liberal democracy to uh, flourish. So they are on their way slowly uh, on the right path. But I don't think that Fukuyama has fully acknowledged the need for cultural homogeneity. And neither has uh, other liberals. Uh, the, liberal, the typical liberal story goes that Europeans have concluded that nationalism was a danger and therefore gradually abandoned it. In the post-war decades, Europeans integrated their states into a web of transnational institutions, culminating, of course, in the European uh, Union. So Europeans entered into a post-national era, or so we are told, which was not only a good thing in itself, but also a model for other regions. That might be the end of history thesis uh, delivered earlier. Nationalism on this uh, liberal view had been a tragic detour on the road to peaceful liberal democratic order. Now, this is a wrong story in my opinion, but it must be admitted though that the creation of a peaceful order of nation states has often been the product of a violent process of ethnic separation. In areas where that separation has not yet fully occurred, politics is still conflict-driven. Whereas in 1900, the year 1900, there were many states in Europe without a single overwhelmingly dominant nationality. Remember, large parts of Europe were dominated by empires. By 2022, there are only a few. Belgium and Switzerland uh, could be mentioned. Uh, but Belgium has been close to breaking up. Uh, and in Switzerland, the balance of power between the Swiss nations is protected by strict citizenship laws. So, to cut a long story short, in Europe, the separatist project had, has not so much vanished as triumphed. European stability in the post-war period has in fact been due to the widespread fulfillment of the nationalist project. So it has not managed, it has fulfilled. Now, there are two major ways of thinking about national identity. One is that all people who live within a country's borders are part of the nation, regardless of their ethnic, racial, or cultural, and religious origins. This is what you might term liberal nationalism. However, the concept of national identity that I will defend defines a nation by a shared heritage, which includes a common language and a sense of belonging to a common territory, a place that one can call our homeland. So language and territory are the two most important uh, features. But also such things as common faith, traditions, ancestry and history is important. In, in short, what we call a common culture. So nationalism is, of course, all about belonging, to use Roger Scruton's uh, phrase. Politically speaking, this implies that each nation ought to have its own state and that each state should be made up of the members of a single nation. Nationalism has, in my view, been the strongest political force in modern history, and it still is. Just look at the Ukrainians. So, a process of ethnic unmixing took place in the first part of the 20th century and in the years immediately following the end of World War II. As a result, the nationalist ideal was largely realized. For the most part, each nation in Europe had its own state, and each state was made up almost exclusively of a single ethnic nationality with a common culture. Some of the exceptions to this rule included Czechoslovakia, Soviet Union, and Yugoslavia. But the subsequent fate of these countries only demonstrated the vitality of nationalism. So, nationalism has frequently led to tension, no need to hide this fact, but, and this is my point, nationalism has also proved to be a source of cohesion and stability. To use Jerry Muller's argument, liberal democracy and ethnic and cultural homogeneity 
are not only compatible, they can be complementary. The main reason Europe has been so harmonious since World War II is not due to the failure of nationalism, but to its success. Nationalism removes some of the greatest sources of conflict, both within and between con countries. The fact that national and state boundaries now largely coincide has meant that there are fewer disputes over borders or secession movements. So, to conclude, these culturally homogeneous policies have displayed a great deal of internal solidarity, a high level of mutual trust, and facilitated the establishment of welfare states. However, in recent decades, we have seen some transformations of the homogeneous nation-states of Europe. These transformations have come from the, immigrant, from the immigration of people from Asian, African, and Middle Eastern origin, especially uh, Muslim countries. A number of factors, from official multiculturalism to generous welfare states, to the ease of contact with ethnic homelands, have made it possible to create parallel societies where assimilation into the larger culture is limited. This is a crucial issue, and it will not just go away, but neither will nationalism. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, I will uh, try to make some brief comments uh, on what has been said here in the, these very interesting uh, papers. But first, I would uh, actually like to congratulate the organizers of this conference for this excellent uh, opportunity and uh, well-planned exercise that we have had here in this wonderful place uh, with well-chosen uh, speakers. It has been a very successful event in my opinion and I have been to a lot of conferences and meetings and organized uh, some of them myself so I'm speaking uh, as somebody who uh, knows a little bit about these things. What the conservatives are right is of course that uh, not all life is uh, economic, there is a lot uh, more to it but economists they have, a, they have an ability to throw light on uh, certain aspects that are sometimes overlooked. And I would like to tell you a story about uh, uh, one of my intellectual mentors, uh, Ludwig von Mises, to illustrate this. It was uh, told to me by uh, a, a friend of mine. I never met von Mises himself. Uh, he died in 1973 when I was 20 years old. Uh, but uh, shortly before he died, he was uh, on a lecture tour. In fact, his last lecture tour in San Francisco. And my friend uh, was taking him and his wife on a tour of San Francisco. And uh, Mises was more than 90 years old, uh, so he was dozing off in the back seat of the car. And uh, then they drove through Broadway in San Francisco, where there's a lot of striptease bars and neon lights and so on. And his uh, wife, Margit von Mises, said, Lou, look, look there, naked ladies. And uh, von Mises woke up from his uh, slumber and said, Ah, bad for the clothing industry. <laughs> and this is an illustration of uh, how economists can throw new light on old uh, problems. So I think we shouldn't uh, really reject uh, economists. It is true, however, that what we are talking about now, national sovereignty, is uh, not least about identity. The reason uh, the Norwegians seceded from the Swedes in uh, uh, 1905 was that they wanted to be Norwegians. They were not uh, enemies of the Swedes, but they, were, they had a diff different identity. Uh, the, the reason why the Finns seceded from Russia in uh, December 1917 was that they wanted to be Finns, not Russians. The reason we in Iceland seceded from Denmark, uh, which was really the softest and most pleasant colonial power you could think of, uh, was in 1918 that we wanted to be Icelanders, not Danes. They didn't quite understand us that we wanted to be Icelanders, but that's just uh, 1,100 years of a shared history, a common language, uh, all kinds of familiarity that uh, Roger Scruton uh, spoke about. So the argument for identity is one argument for national sovereignty. 
there, there are actually uh, other arguments as well, uh, social and economic. The social argument is, of course, that small uh, uh, nation states are more flexible. They are, uh, the, those who hold power, they are closer to those uh, over whom the power is wielded. And uh, th this, of course, uh, finds expression in the Catholic principle of subsidiarity. Uh, and uh, this is the reason Hayek thought that the small uh, states were more humane units than, uh, than big states. But I would like to present uh, an economic argument as well. I would like to tell you that I believe that uh, nationalists have to be economic liberals. Uh, they have to support the free market. The reason is that economic integration facilitates political disintegration. Because if you have a large common market and small political units, then the small political units benefit from the division of labor that's being enabled by the large market. This is, of course, what Arthur Smith pointed out when he said that the division of labor uh, is limited by the extent of the market. The more extensive the market is, the more benefits there are from the division of labor, but that means that we have political units, as has been pointed out here, that uh, the reason why now we have uh, about 200 states in the world, and we had about 50 states in 1945, is that it is simply more economically feasible to have small states if you have large uh, markets. So globalization has not destroyed the nation state. Uh, quite the contrary, it has made the nation state, uh, small political units, uh, more easier. Uh, it has facilitated it. So uh, <clears throat> these three arguments are arguments of national sovereignty, the argument from identity, the argument from cohesion, and the argument from economic uh, integration. But I would like just to say finally that uh, there is a saying, there's a very famous expression in Swedish, Folkhemet, uh, <coughs> that the Social Democrats used. But we have to realize, if we just probe into the concept, that there are two kinds of families. One family is the one into which we are born, and we have parents, and they, uh, we have to obey them. They bring us up. They know better than we do. Is this... Uh, the meaning of Folkhemet, that we have a nanny state or a big brother who's always watching us, that kind of family? Or do we have uh, the other uh, kind of family, Th that is the family that we form after we leave our first family and form our second family and become individuals and choose? And that's precisely what uh, Romeo and Julia did that I mentioned before, the individuals. They were not satisfied with being only a Capulet or a Montagu, they were Romeo and Juliet. They were uh, individuals. They left their families with tragic consequences in their uh, case, but not, not at all in our case. So, if Volkhemet means the old family where you have somebody ruling over you by virtue of being your parent, then I say that is not fit uh, for uh, uh, a free society. But if Volkhemet means that we uh, have a, a nice and a pleasant family that we formed ourselves by our own choices, uh, then I'm all for it. Finally, I would say, you know, Europe must be uh, composed of communities and not be a fortress. And the nation state should not be a prison, but a home. Well, those were all uh, very interesting uh, takes on, on what it means for, to, to see national sovereignty through. There's one bit that I'm, I'm particularly interested in, which is this idea of, of bringing power as local as possible and, and, and making things f familiar. Uh, and one of the things that I was sort of reflecting on is the US Declaration of Independence, which was about having the 13 colonies breaking away from a foreign empire. And uh, I've taken a couple of quotes from it, because within the body of the text are a list of grievances, uh, 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 mainly aimed at King George III. Uh, for example, uh, he has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uh, uncomfortable, and distant. Uh, there's another bit where they talk about he has erected a multitude of new offices and sent uh, hither swarms of officers to harass our people. Uh, and there's a final one for where they 
claim that uh, he has cut us off from trading with the world. So that I, as I reflect on those three points, it, it sort of becomes to me sort of interesting that there's a parallel perhaps with supranational bodies, that these supranational bodies sort of expand uninhibited. They interfere in the day-to-day -day structures of, uh, of individual nation states. They prevent them from doing the things that they would otherwise be able to do as sovereign states. So perhaps Jorge might handle that first and we'll come down the line. Yeah, well, it's, um, well uh, you, you've, you're, you're, you're setting a, a really high standard in terms of subsidiarity and kind of proximity to the citizen there by, by quoting the, the Declaration of Independence. I think one of the, one of the um, paradoxes in, in the, the EU is, is that, so the EU knows it is undemocratic and it, it, it tries to cover up uh, the um, remote distance at which decisions are, are taken relative to the, to the European citizen. It tries to cover up that distance by saying, you know, the, this, you know we're all about you. The EU is, you know, the, a Europe of citizens. You know, the EU is is all of us together. Uh, but I think the the reality is that, um, um, you know, we're seeing it with the, the elections to the to the European Parliament, which are still primarily fought along national lines and not European ones. Um, Euro European citizens want to be, uh, you know, want to be talked about their uh, issues of national concern, and there, there's no European demos. So I think um, so. I think that's one of the paradoxes. And I think, I mean, you've you've spoken about this eloquently, Rob, when uh, when we had that uh, debate with Rodrigo Ballester with MCC, and we we uh, the, the 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 title of, of that event was uh, subsidiarity or centralization. Right? What is the future going to be? And I think. Um, and I think we're, we're headed towards uh, centralization. Uh, subsidiarity is essentially uh, the notion that, you know, uh, the, the EU should be doing uh, only as much as, as necessary and the states should retain every, as much as possible. But we're, that's not what's happening. We're, we're seeing the EU take ever larger uh, swaths of, of sovereignty. We're seeing the jurisprudence of the ECJ, which is essentially con conceived to expand the powers of the EU. So there's no, there's no such, I mean, uh, th that's, that's, I think, one of, the, one, of the, one of the key problems is that we don't have a, a judiciary that is going to hold uh, the supranational institutions in check like you have in, in America. In, in Europe, the courts are there to f advance the mandate of the supranational institutions. Um, I wonder what... Christian? Yeah, I just want to follow up and, <clears throat> and then agree with uh, George here. But uh, I think that if you really believe that sovereign nation states is the best way of having democracy and economic development in the long run, then of course you are more or less programmatically against unions taking that sovereignty away. And we have some really good examples in Europe that has not been very successful. It was the Soviet Union and also the European Union having great difficulties. And of course you are against empires because empires are also taking away your sovereignty. That was the First World War in a way when the, when the um, Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire broke down and there it started it all because it was some kind of heterogeneous system that was not sustainable in a kind of new kind of thinking that they wouldn't accept it. So what we actually see that how do we develop a global system taking care of this national sovereignty, accepting that uh, nationalism is <laughs> the, actually the, the biggest driver as presented uh, from uh, Denmark and how do we handle that and do the very important distinction between nationalism and imperialism? Because and in a national view, you have no right outside your nation's territory. And that's why the German expansion during the Second World War was not uh, uh, justified in any means or another. And I think it's very important to do these distinctions, clear it out, and make this new, um, new story. And, and as I try to end, we need this new story. We need to handle the criticism. We need to say why we believe this is best for peace, it's best for uh, the economy, and it's then totally best for the new global order. And that's our challenge, actually. We cannot make it any less, because there is where we are challenged. And that there are where there are no coming, for example, in the Norwegian debate that, oh, no, we have to join the European Union because it's a peace project, just looked at Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Very hard for me to see this combination of thoughts, but that's what we are presented, and that's what we need to answer. Thank you. Kasper? Well, 
Finally, Europeans got rid of empires through a long and very violent process, and now we're that now people are trying to establish an empire again. I mean, that's plain stupid, uh, because uh, to um, um, get, try to get rid of national nationalism is well, it's not recommendable, because it will pop up again um, and and return with with vengeance. So, <laughs> so we really should be uh, t take note of, of the violent European history and, and, and consolidate na na nation states. But I think that there are, are two other problems besides this uh, problem with uh, democratic legitimacy. Of course, uh, Roger Scruton has written about this and transnational jurisdiction always leads to a, a decline in, in uh, accountability. But the other problem is that what's the idea behind the EU's um, um, integrating force. It can't, be, it can't be that Europeans are united through a common culture, because they don't have the common culture, don't, they don't have the same territory and the same language, two most important elements. So it must be the idea that they are united through a constitutional patriotism. That is, a, a, a common adherence to the abstract principles in the constitution. But that has never united anybody. That's one problem. The other problem is the EU doesn't have any identity. And, and you, cannot, you cannot feel connected or attached to, to things that does not have identity. I mean, EU is built up uh, again uh, around this, uh, these abstract principles. And that's also why uh, they tried to, uh, at least for some years, uh, to uh, make uh, uh, Turkey a member of EU. Why? Because the EU doesn't have any identity. They, the EU don't recognize that thin, common European identity. We, we do have, though, Christianity and so forth. But, but Christianity they, they couldn't be written into the Constitution, for instance. So it's a purely abstract project, and nobody can feel committed to an, to a, an abstract project. We need culture. Common culture, and of course, you can read all about this in in, Root, in Scruton's texts. It's it's almost as Theresa May said to to much um, protest by the media a few years ago, where she talked about people who describe themselves as being citizens of everywhere end up being citizens of nowhere. Um, <laughs> Hannes. Well, the qu question about the future of the European Union is really whether it will be an open market or a closed uh, state. And, uh, I think that the um, ideals of the European Union were, were to be applauded uh, to make peace and not war. Uh, it was really a peace um, treaty between Germany and France and the other nations followed that they uh, proclaimed the um, four freedoms. But uh, there are uh, countries in Europe uh, that are not really um, fit for this because uh, they just have other uh, concerns. Uh, I think uh, Iceland and Norway, for example, we are not a part of this continental project. We, we were not, not at war with uh, any, any of them, so it, we don't belong there. But I would actually like to use the opportunity uh, to say a few words about the Nordic solution to a pressing problem, which is now the war in Ukraine. I think that in the history and in the experience of the Nordic countries, there are actually solutions to the Ukrainian uh, problem. One of them is what I would call the Danish solution. In 1920, uh, the borders between Denmark and Germany were rearranged by plebiscites in uh, three uh, regions. Actually, uh, the uh, northernmost voted for belonging to Denmark, the, uh, the center one voted for belonging to Germany, and it was clear that the southern one wouldn't, uh, would uh, belong to Germany, so uh, the, uh, the referendum there was cancelled. This is an excellent way of rearranging borders, and I think that the only a solution possible for the Ukrainian conflict is to have plebiscites or referenda in the uh, contested areas, Luhansk and, and Donbass, and have an immediate ceasefire there. This is the Danish solution. Then we have the uh, Icelandic Norwegian solution. And it is uh, actually, uh, if we accept that it would be a provocation of the Russians that Ukraine would uh, join NATO or the European Union, even if Ukraine should uh, decide her fate herself. Obviously, I believe in that, but uh, let us, for, for the sake of argument, accept that. Why can't then Ukraine uh, join the EEA, the European Economic Area, 
uh, and I have proposed this, uh, but uh, nobody outside Norway and Iceland and Liechtenstein seem to know what the EA is. But uh, I think that this would be an excellent way of integrating Ukraine in the West, welcome it to the, uh, her to the West where she belongs and where she wants to be, EEA. So that's the Norwegian Icelandic uh, solution. Then we have the Finnish solution. And let me uh, tell you what that is. Uh, uh, or the Orland uh, Erna, uh, the uh, Orland uh, Islands, they uh, speak Swedish, but they belong to Finland. And uh, they wanted for a while to join Sweden. They felt that they belonged there, and there was a referendum about it, but uh, uh, the International Court in ha The Hague uh, decided that it belonged to Finland. But Finland has given them so much, uh, almost sovereignty, so much self-rule, that they are perfectly happy to be a part of Finland. And uh, Lord Acton, one of the uh, thinkers that I uh, write about in my book, he says, the test of a society is how it treats, uh, treats its uh, minorities. And uh, the Finnish, uh, they treat the Holland Islands in such a way that they have no uh, wish to, to secede from Finland. And this is what should happen to the minorities in Ukraine and Russia, that uh, Russia should uh, uh, treat its minorities well, and so should Ukraine. And uh, th this should be the task of, of the international community. So I think that even in this case, uh, the Nordic countries can offer three uh, solutions based on uh, its experience to the Ukrainian problem. It's very interesting, but of course, um, w one of the things that I think all four of you have, have brought up uh, is, is this idea that supranationalism or empire sitting above a nation state uh, in effect encourages nationalism. So I, I'm sort of wondering if, if perhaps empire is in itself a catalyst for nationalism, that, that people don't really appreciate the identity they have until they no longer have it. And I'm, I'm going to offer sort of four examples of this from history that I can think of. Uh, the first one is French revanchism in the late 1800s, when Alsace-Lorraine was occupied by the German Empire. And what it encouraged was the rise of nationalism and national pride in France that had ultimately not existed since the times of the French Revolution because they had felt like a defeated and destroyed country for, for decades afterwards. Uh, so that, that's the first example. The second one I think of is of Baltic nationalism under the Soviet Union, which is that under the USSR, there was a period of Russification where Russia tried to stamp out and destroy the individual identity of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. They tried to wipe out their languages. They tried to impose Russian as a native language. Uh, and come the 1990s, they were the first three nations to break away from the USSR and declare independence. And they reclaimed quite proudly their national identity. You, 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 know, you still recognize it today that they are incredibly proud nations. The third one that I can think of is the recent rise of what people describe as national populism in Europe that under the European Union's current system, with the more power is taken away from the member states, the more we see these movements rising up. Italy is a very notable example where I think now more than 50% of the population would vote for a, a, a nationalist-leaning <coughs> political party. Uh, and the final example is, is one of, of Ukraine, actually, which is that uh, I, I've been going to Ukraine for, for almost annually for a, a decade now, and have come to know a lot of people there. And, and one of the interesting changes I have seen since the start of the conflict is that those friends of mine who are Ukrainians by nationality, but ethnically were Russian, have disowned their Russian identity. Uh, they find themselves apologizing for the fact that they don't speak Ukrainian and are now teaching themselves Ukrainian. And in a sense, it's created, it, across the country, there's an upsurge in a strong feeling of... Uh, being Ukrainian because they're fighting a, a foreign imperial aggressor. So do, do you all think then that this kind of supranationalism or, or what Yoram Hazani would refer as empire is, is a catalyst that encourages nationalism on, and sovereignty? Yeah. Well, I think you're, you're making a very, very astute and, and, and sharp uh, point, and I think it, it, it merits historical analysis to, to kind of analyze why why it is that nationalism has tended to flourish in opposition to a supranational entity, if I understand your, your thought correctly. And I think that's certainly the case historically, but 
and 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 this is one of the this is one of the um, the tragedies about the EU. I mean, uh, so for instance, I come from a country that where there's been no significant pushback against EU membership. I come from a country where support for EU membership has always hovered around the eight, uh, the eighty percent mark. I mean, it, it has been very very supportive of EU membership ever since. Uh, but because it, nationally, what uh, Spain and Spaniards have told themselves is that Europe means emerging out of Francoism and into democracy. So that there's this sort of national story that is told. But um, so coming from a country like that, I was very saddened when, for instance, I was in Hungary over the summer, and I realized that uh, people in, in countries like Poland and Hungary, um, especially the, the sort of the more Eurosceptic segment of public opinion, tends to see the EU in a similar way as they, they, they used to see the USSR. I mean, there, there's even this sort of um, memorable hashtag, EUSSR, right? And that, I think, speaks to Robert's point. The fact that, uh, yes, a na national sentiment is, is, is um, often built in opposition to, uh, to a supranational power that you see as unaccountable, that you can't really make any difference in. Um, and I think, uh, and I think that's that's one, again, it's one of the tragedies of, about the EU, especially when you look at the history of Central Europe. The, the countries of Central Europe hoped to emerge from subjugation after the the end of the Cold War, when they when they break free from from the yoke of, of the Soviet Union. But many many people in those countries are now feeling like the new yoke is this supranational empire that is that is um, overweening and, and sort of... Um, so I, I think you're definitely onto something there. I, I think, Christian, you wanted to come in there. <clears throat> yeah, I, um, I think your observations are very important, but uh, it could also be interpreted in another way that it is not the way that these supernatural powers are imposing uh, a kind of nationalist movement by for nationalism in itself, but it's because of the lack of democracy, the lack of influence on your own situation. And what we actually saw in the in, in the 19th century and uh, and the building of the nation state was the nation state which gave the best democracy. It gave the closest and best possible way of having democracies and increasing living standards. And then the national state is a kind of vehicle to achieve that. And uh, so I think much of this is coming down to democracy, more or less, in different aspects. Democracy and freedom. And then you can add on to, to what uh, Milton Friedman wrote about uh, capitalism and freedom. So we have this, try to sort out this nation states, democracy, freedom, economy, which has to be built as the new story around the new, new uh, vision for, for how to arrange it. And I think, Casper, you want yeah. to come in as well. <clears throat> well there's nothing as uh, useful for uh, unity as a common enemy, of course. And the reason is that uh, identity depends on difference. I mean, I am somebody because I am not the other person. And that goes for uh, nations uh, as well. But the question is, uh, what will happen the day that the Russians are no longer there, if it happens? Will Ukraine then emerge as a homogeneous nation state? Mm, maybe, maybe not, because, um, I mean, Samuel Huntington, Huntington wrote uh, ter terrifically good on this uh, subject in A Clash of Civilizations, where he actually predicted what, more or less, what happens today, because what he said was, Ukraine is a torn country. And so Ukrainians have to deal with this messy problem. And in East European countries and, and other places, the history, the track record is quite bad. Who knows? I'd hope for the best. I think that we have to make a distinction between two kinds of nationalism. One is the aggressive one that uh, believes that one's own nation is superior to other nations. The other one is the peaceful one which believes that uh, you have to cherish your uh, country and love it, but at the same time you have to respect uh, the love of other uh, nations for their countries and uh, you are not trying to conquer them in any way. And small nations are, are more apt to ho hold this kind of non-militaristic uh, uh, nationalism, uh, not least because they are simply powerless. They cannot impose their will on others. But uh, your question brought up a very interesting, I think, uh, question, which is this. Why does Switzerland succeed while the Habsburg Empire failed? And I think the reason is decentralization, 
in, uh, in, uh, in, in Switzerland. What they did basically after a short civil war and you know, being divided into uh, four linguistic communities and several religious minorities was to uh, accept the decentralization of power, which had actually existed before, but they uh, accepted it. This would also have been uh, solved the problem in South Africa. I was there in 1987. And uh, it was, uh, I, I spoke to a lot of people there. There were uh, more or less four uh, groups there, the blacks, that were 20 million, and the whites, that were 5 million, and the uh, coloreds, that were 3 million, and then Indians, 1 million. And uh, <coughs> the, the whites realized that they had to hand over power to the uh, majority. But, uh, you know, should we really hand over power? Shouldn't we really try to do something else? Friends of mine in South Africa, they wrote a book called South Africa, The Solution, where they said that the, the best thing was to divide uh, South Africa up into cantons, self-governing cantons, and then it would move from one place to another which uh, uh, reminds me of uh, your quote about Ernest de Renan, uh, that, uh, that the nation is a daily plebiscite. And, uh, you know, there would be a daily plebiscite. If you, if you feel that you're oppressed by the uh, authorities in your canton, you just move to another canton. You move from Johannesburg to Cape Town or whatever. This would have uh, broken the spell of power uh, in, in South Africa. And uh, a third example would be Czechoslovakia. The reason uh, Czechoslovakia failed was that suddenly both the Slovaks and the Germans in the Sudendaland, they found themselves being ruled by Czechs. Nobody had uh, asked them uh, for it. So I think we have to have a flexible system of various uh, units, political units and others, federations and so on. There is no one size that fits all. Uh, the best thing is to have flexibility and the freedom of movement. Do we have time for one more or should we? No, okay. In which case, let's uh, thank our panelists for that excellent discussion.